Now, I'm told I only get one question, so uh, what we're asking is that you get involved in the conversation and ask questions. So I'm going to ask my question, and while I'm doing that, and uh, the Premier's responding, please be thinking of your questions because we want you to be involved. And we've got people roaming through here, four people with mics. Put your hand up and they will come to you. Uh, make it short and sharp and punchy, if you will, and please let us know who you're directing your question to. So, Premier, 20 months in and uh, we've just heard about all your achievements. Well done. Thank you, Jeff. That's Thank you, it. Jeff. No, but uh, obviously there are some issues um, of concern for public servants. I'm hearing that a lot of public servants and others uh, do have concerns about one of the things you raised in your speech today, which is the amalgamations, uh, the mergers, 41 down to 25. Um, a lot of public servants are saying, and there's many people in here that deal with these uh, big departments, super departments, they're saying there's um, chaos, there's paralysis. Do you acknowledge that there are some issues in some areas in relation to where you've done these mergers? And if so, what are you going to do to fix it? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Jess. Um, I haven't heard that before. Um, but it, is, uh, it, does, it does take... Um, Change often is difficult for people to manage, and as you know, most of you would come from um, major companies. Uh, change is something that is uh, an ongoing sort of thing. But what we've done is something that's completely rational, and that is put agencies together that should be together. Western Australia had 41 agencies or departments. It was the most of any state, most of the, more than the Commonwealth. Uh, Victoria has seven, New South Wales had 10 or so, South Australia 15, uh, Queensland 20 or so. We've only taken it down to 25. I think there was probably scope to go a bit further, but we thought that was a rational allocation. We put regulatory agencies together, we put social agencies together, put financial agencies together, economic agencies together, uh, so there were synergies developed uh, between them. Uh, obviously, it's been in place a bit over a year, uh, uh, 16 months or so now. Uh, it does um, take time to bed things down, but most of the feedback I get is it's a much more rational and sensible decision-making approach. And you also uh, get agencies collaborating to a far greater degree to get outcomes. And that's, you know, that's, that's what everyone wants. Now, obviously, um, you, you can't keep everyone happy, and I suppose that's what's happened here. Thanks, Premier. And we've got a question up the back. Just a reminder, please, no statements, questions, and keep them short and sharp. Uh, hello. Chris Toomey from Wacos. Um, Premier, I noted in your opening comments you talked about how you've been able to combine fairness and compassion and good financial management. Um, I guess my, my question is that from the community sector we've been concerned about some of the impacts we've seen on the poorest and most vulnerable around rising household fees and charges. Now that you've got the surplus coming in, is there going to be something that's going to be done to give relief to people in financial hardship? Uh, thank you, uh, Chris, uh, for the question. As you know, uh, one of the things we did when we came to office was we reinstated uh, support for financial counselling, so people who might uh, be in difficulty, have difficulty paying their synergy or their water bill or what have you, uh, had uh, the opportunity fi for financial counselling, so we funded that to the tune of an additional five or six million dollars per annum. We also put in place a requirement that if you're seeking uh, a what's called a hugs payment, which is an assistance payment uh, to meet your water bill or your electricity bill, you first of all had to have a referral from a financial counsellor. So you didn't automatically get the payment. You had to go through a financial counselling service first so that uh, we, we, we insisted people get some advice and assistance in relation to budgeting before they got a government handout. Now, I regard those things as just sensible good governance and as helping people help themselves. In terms of the uh, $1.7 billion um, GST top-up we got, just so people understand how much that is, um, it's um, about 2% of the annual budget we've got additional. So uh, it's a little bit on the top, uh, but it helps a lot. We've said we're putting the money into uh, a debt reduction account, uh, and that means over the first three years it's $1.7 billion. That will go straight towards paying off debt and reduce our interest payments. With that reduction in interest payments, there is some scope, I suppose, uh, to assist a bit uh, when it comes to um, the, uh, the cost of living matters that are out there. I, you know, I feel very, very deeply that um, people are struggling with those things. So that gives us a little bit of scope to assist there, but we'll consider that in the lead up to the budget. 
Fantastic. Keep the questions coming. And we've got uh, another familiar face up the back there. Peter Kennedy. Far away. Get ready. Thank I, you very I'm much, I'm assuming Jess. it's for the Premier, but I'll let you go, PK. Peter Kennedy from uh, Business News. And my question uh, relates to Metronet. And the little brochure here that we've all got says Metronet is well underway. And, and my, pre my question for you, Premier, is uh, what can you tell us about uh, Metronet, particularly the uh, Forestfield Tunnel? Uh, what progress is being made on that? There's been some problems with it. Can you tell us a little bit about the timetable? Will it have an effect on cost? And uh, how are you going to ensure that there's no cost blowout in the Metronet project? Uh, well, just so you all understand, uh, Peter's referring to the airport rail link, uh, which is um, under construction now. Uh, that was uh, obviously started under the last government. It's had some... Um, technical difficulties with some of the tunnelling. Um, as I understand it, the government and the uh, company are working to resolve those issues. When it comes to the other, um, the other components of it, uh, there's an extension to Yanchep, an extension to Byford, Coburn-Thornley um, east-west connection between those two uh, places, and then a rail line from the Midland line uh, up to uh, Ellenbrook. Uh, we've got the Commonwealth to fund most of those things. Uh, there will be a requirement for a bit of state money, but we got the Commonwealth to fund uh, most of them, and I must say former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull was extremely keen uh, on these uh, rail projects, so we worked very cooperatively to uh, get that uh, financial support. Uh, look, in terms of um, the budgets on these, the projects are out to tender currently, in particular Yanship and Thornley uh, Coburn are currently out to tender. We're currently doing the business case on the Ellenbrook line, which will determine the exact, what we expect is the exact costing and then we'll put that out to, uh, out to tender as well. Uh, and uh, maybe the Treasurer has something in addition to add. He might, he might have more facts than I have in that nutshell. No, Premier, I think you've nailed that answer beautifully. It's, um, uh, PK, uh, you're right. I mean, the question is how do you guarantee no-cost blowouts? That's the thing that keeps, obviously, me and Treasury awake at night, ensuring uh, that doesn't happen. Now, uh, that's the point of the layers of business cases that we're doing with Infrastructure Australia. Uh, that's very, very thorough, and we're required to, particularly on Ellenbrook, for example, examine, I think, from memory, four different possible routes, uh, and that'll be narrowed down to the, to the preferred route uh, in due course. And the point of that is so that we get what you can effectively cover off on um, absolutely positively done. Now, things will happen, for example, that we're seeing on the Forestfield line now uh, that perhaps are unexpected during construction, uh, but we, the point of the business case is to try and eliminate as much as you possibly can any cost pressures uh, that, um, that you can account for. The Premier's uh, right. The, um, that project, the Forestfield Airport Rail Link, was obviously started under the previous government. The Metronet signs went up and the branding went up pretty quickly after uh, the McGowan government was elected, though. Uh, but it's interesting when things go wrong. I'm going to keep an eye and see if that signing stays up in Bayswater, where I live, Premier. Um, and uh, the Minister, the Transport Minister, Rita Safiotti, has indicated that a report is coming up before Christmas on the sinkhole that's uh, formed there in uh, Forestfield in terms of the problems with the water sinking in, uh, and that will apparently give some uh, cost implications. Have we got any more questions? Because I'm fired up. I've got a few more, but I'm more than happy to hand over to, to people in the audience. Fantastic. Premier, you have uh, foreshadowed... Just getting comfortable here, Premier. I'm going to go out with a bang from this job. Um, no, you foreshadowed a, a, a cabinet reshuffle, and I can see that the Treasurer doesn't look uh, on edge anymore now that he's delivered that surplus, and you've taken the credit there. But um, uh, I know that uh, you've been talking about we're not going to see any new faces, and I know that there's a plenty of people on your backbench that are really upset. But if we're talking about... Uh, the reshuffle then. Is that a bit of a change of portfolio then? Can we characterise it as a minor reshuffle? Is that a fair enough terminology? Uh, that would be fair and I think if you listened, you clearly didn't listen to my speech Jess because I gave the Treasurer all the credit for the, uh, sur the surplus that's uh, coming in the mid-year review uh, and I might say um, he's uh, I think uh, done a better job than any Treasurer in the country uh, and certainly lasted longer than in the job than most Federal Treasurers recently. Um, it is... Um, it would be a, um, I think it would be categorised if we do anything, which we'll make a decision on shortly, uh, as fairly modest, fairly modest changes. But obviously, as I said recently, I think the Cabinet's doing well. Uh, people are, um, understand that we live in um, financially constrained times, and so uh, ministers get that. 
uh, and the cabinet that's there has done the, you know, the difficult work in opposition. And in political life, it's like anything. Um, people who uh, got to have earned what you get. Uh, and the people in cabinet have earned their place there because they did the difficult years in opposition. And opposition is not easy. I know there's some shadow ministers here today. Uh, when you go from government, particularly if you've only ever known government, to opposition, it's a complete, utter shock to the system whereby you have to do everything yourself. Uh, and so um, cabinet ministers have been through that. So there's a, um, a degree of resilience and understanding and work ethic that I think is admirable amongst the cabinet members. And you're correct. You did actually give him credit. You just stole his thunder. And now I'm, I'm, I'm not as excited as I was about covering the mid-year review, Treasurer. We've got Good. a question. Fantastic. Please keep them coming. Please think. I mean, journalists ask questions every day and we probably ask the same um, about the same issues. So please have a think about something that affects you. We've got a question up the back. Hi, my name's Louise Gelito from the WA Council of Social Service. My question's for Minister McGurk. Um, we're in a process of this 16 day, day campaign to stop domestic violence against women. I thank you for your courage. Now, this is not the normal audience I imagine that you're always in front of, considering your portfolio. So what would be your key messages to all these businesses here about how they can get behind this campaign and stop the deaths that are occurring in our community? Thanks very much, Louisa. No, I didn't um, set that question up, but thanks, that's great. And I do thank CEDA for their support of the 16 Days in WA campaign. Um, because as was said, uh, this is a recognition that, um, well, first of all, in WA, we have high levels of domestic violence. That's the reality. We have the second highest rates in the country. Uh, we need to make sure we respond to that violence. So we're there for victims. We hold perpetrators to account. Our justice system understands the particular dynamics of domestic violence and the like. Uh, it's a huge part of police's work. It's something like 60% of, of local policing work relates to domestic violence. So it's important that, that all of those systems understand what's going on and provide good support. But of course this violence doesn't have to occur. It is preventable. And so 16 Days in WA is an opportunity to get the message out in the community that uh, Violence is never okay. Uh, violence against women, uh, and in, uh, obviously in a domestic setting that often involves children as well, is completely unacceptable. It doesn't matter what community you're living in, doesn't matter what the circumstances, this is not acceptable. But to answer your question, Louise, about what, what, for instance, this audience can do, I've been incredibly heartened by the support of some of the corporations based in Western Australia, for instance... Um, when I first came to office meeting with Rio Tinto uh, who were talking about some of their gender equity issues and I was saying that in the public sector we've put in place 10 days public leave for public servants experiencing domestic violence um, and in fact there's been quite a take up of that leave um, which shows that there was a real need there and Rio said well we're that's something that we think we could do so as a result of that they've now put that in place nationally for their 19,000 employees, and they've gone on now to be white ribbon accredited. So they're doing very proactive work amongst their largely male-dominated workforce about getting out a message that this violence is not acceptable. Uh, and as leaders in the community, I call on everyone here to think about what you can do in your organisations to give that message. And of course, we all have to give that message in our personal lives as well, perhaps to the young people in our lives, the way we conduct ourselves and the like. So it's a message that as a government, we're very, very serious about um, taking a leadership role, but working in partnership with um, community corporations, but community organisations, sporting clubs to get that message out. Thanks, Minister. And uh, we've got another question. Um, Patrick Peake, uh, Treasurer. Before you were elected, you had some very positive um, proposals for dealing with issues in the Aboriginal communities. I'm just wondering how those were going. I can't see you. I know you're there somewhere. Ah, just, oh, thank yeah. you. Um, uh, well, there's actually a lot going on in Aboriginal affairs, so thanks for, thanks for the question. A lot of the work that we've been doing has been very much around uh, what has been neglected now for 20, 30 years. Uh, around the, the legislative architecture, if you like, of Aboriginal affairs, primarily in the Aboriginal Heritage Act. 
Uh, many people in this room will have come across the Heritage Act in its day-to-day -day operations. Everybody is dissatisfied with that piece of legislation, so uh, including Aboriginal groups, because it's, this is a piece of legislation that went through the Parliament in the early 1970s, well before native title was recognised as, as a legal reality in Australia. Uh, so uh, modernising that, which we expect to do next year, uh, will have a big part around recognising what has happened in native title, recognising the rights of traditional owners uh, and by bringing together state land initiatives, if you like, and uh, native title rights that have been now well won in Western Australia, uh, both exclusive possession and non-exclusive across uh, Western Australia. We want to see more economic rights therefore recognised through those native title opportunities and you would have seen just recently with the announcement uh, made by the government around contentious issue around fracking, uh, but that actually brings Aboriginal people front and centre in the decision making process uh, as well. That's, I guess, to a certain extent new for the, a WA government, but for all those um, uh, oil and gas companies that have been in this space for a long period of time now, it's something that they're well practised in, in, in agreement making. And that's really realigning the internal structure of the WA government around Aboriginal affairs in doing what we do well, and that's agreement making. So uh, that's been, I think, the big shift. That'll be put, give some legislative momentum next year. Um, and other, other outside of that, you've, there's, a, there's a range of things going on around, those remote, around the remote communities. For me, uh, it's always struck me as uh, infuriating that you get a range of remote communities, in fact, a lot of them, that spend a huge amount of their operating uh, income each and every year on diesel. Uh, it, is, uh, it is an expensive way to run a community. Uh, Synergy uh, and Horizon and Western Power now have done a lot of work around how do we make it uh, more sustainable and, and encourage more communities to take up uh, community solar. They haven't done it for a range of reasons, land tenure, cost, etc. Uh, I think we've found a solution to that now uh, and that's something that I want to see more of in the next couple of years. This is great. If you can just keep thinking of questions, we've got plenty of time left to go, so uh, it's much better to get them from the floor. And we're just heading down to... There you go. Hi, Kitty Brodonovich, CEO of the Regional Chambers of Commerce and Industry of WA, and also Premier, a very proud non-executive director on the board of Keystar Home Loans, so thank you for that announcement today. My question to you is... Are you able to give us an update, this is on behalf of Regional Chambers, on Infrastructure WA? Uh, thanks, Kitty. Uh, the expectation is we'll bring in legislation early next year. Uh, it's largely drafted now uh, and um, it'll largely, in fact almost entirely, follow the New South Wales model. Uh, I had a briefing about two weeks ago with the New South Wales Minister for Transport and he's Head of Infrastructure New South Wales. and. Um, it seems to, you know, they were glowing about it, uh, in particular the Liberal Party minister over there, how it works and uh, how it's successfully um, getting some alignment between both sides in terms of infrastructure spend in New South Wales, doing proper business case planning, making sure that New South Wales uh, puts uh, decent submissions to Infrastructure Australia. I'd expect that we'd have a similar model uh, to that uh, and I'm very keen, as he, uh, as he, as he emphasised to me a number of times, Make sure that the people you put on the board uh, are not seen as political appointments. So the private sector people have to be non-political, non-aligned, um, but highly respected. So uh, we expect uh, early uh, next year, uh, first it's, we start sitting again in February, I expect uh, soon after we come back uh, that we'll be able to introduce legislation. Oh, and we fund it in the budget, so we've got an allocation for it in the budget. And up the back again, just, that's right, just under the screen. Um, yes, this is Jenny Spring, SAS Institute, Global Data Analytics Company. Uh, my question is about legislation, data sharing legislation. Can you provide an update on when that will be going to Parliament? Okay. Uh, data, data sharing legislation across government is something that um, we're working on, but there's a sort of a, uh, an issue about privacy as well, so that um, we protect people's privacy. I've heard about different models as to whether you include privacy in the data sharing legislation or you have a data sharing act and a privacy act as well. Uh, we currently haven't landed on which one of those we want to do, uh, but Simone can probably answer a little bit better than me about the benefits of data sharing, but essentially data sharing allows an agency such as child support uh, to attack an issue 
uh, or a problem that might um, be around a certain family or a certain community in conjunction with uh, the Department of Housing and potentially the, uh, uh, the police force or whatever it might be, uh, so that there is better coordination across government. So that's why data sharing uh, in the age of big data is an important thing to do, uh, but it's about the privacy aspect. So we're currently working on which, how we do it to protect sort of public release or release of information to private organisations or the like, whether or not we have standalone privacy legislation or we include it into data sharing legislation, but some I might have a bit better details on the benefits of it. Yeah, thanks, Premier. And I think the public would know when they've looked at the way the discussion's gone around my health that unless people are given some assurances about the use of that data, notwithstanding that Facebook probably knows more about any of us than, um, than our own partners do, but, uh, you know, that, that there's, um, there's public concern about it. So the privacy considerations need to be properly heard and dealt with. But from a social policy point of view, when we're thinking about interventions with vulnerable individuals, communities, families, we really do need to get... We acknowledge that we need to get a lot more joined up in our approach and not expect those people or families to traverse their way around different agencies, whether it's the mental health agency or housing or financial counselling, um, drug and alcohol assistance, domestic violence services. We know that we need to work our way and, and come together with those people and their families and their communities. Um, but we also need a, a seamless way of doing that. And where we do that, where we have those services in a joined up way, we're getting much, much better outcomes. And um, I think it might have been, um, uh, a number of you would have been, I was, I was wondering if we've had the event in this room, but a number of people might have been to the Parkerville um, uh, children's services events where their advocacy centre, George Jones Centre, deals with the victims of child sex abuse and that's got a range of different agencies under one roof. So where it's non-familial, um, the victim comes forward with their family, tells their story once and then is given the best quality advice and, um, and service through a very challenging, difficult process, so therapeutic interventions and a good justice um, approach as well. So that's an example where you have a joined up approach, you have good data sharing from a client's point of view, you can get much better outcomes. In terms of tracking how we go with social interventions, there's real opportunities there, particularly with de-identified data. We do that all the time in health, but we're not good at doing it with social policy. And, um, you know, if you think about social outcomes, I've heard it described that it's sometimes measured in terms of intent rather than, uh, rather than effect. So we know it's got lots of heart, we know this is a really good cause, but how do we know these event interventions really work and work over time? That's what we've got to get a lot better at and the use of data is, an, is a crucial tool in that. She's across her brief, Minister. She's got to stay in that portfolio. We've got one just in the middle there, sir. Michael McPhail, KPMG. My question's for Minister White in your energy capacity. Uh, Minister, there, uh, major, there is turmoil in the energy market over east and major technological changes afoot globally and here locally. What are the sort of issues you're mulling about in this portfolio and how do you see Western Australia's energy market generation and distribution changing to the future? Yeah, great question. You're right. Um, I don't want a bar of what's been going on in the NEM and I think it's a really stark and unfortunate example of, of dramatic policy failure that's been going on now for a decade. Um, you would have seen today, I think, in, in today's West Australia, uh, Western Power have finally got themselves to a position where they can make uh, an offer of uh, a significant number of large-scale renewables. One of the problems we've had is the, is the regulatory environment that covers the, uh, Western Power, the asset base of Western Power. Uh, so moving that from an unconstrained to a constrained, effectively, uh, model will allow larger generators to connect without the sort of upgrades, expensive connection costs that we've seen to date. We, we like most places in most developed world um, economies, have the issue of plateauing demand. Uh, demand will really come from the retirement of, of older generators, and uh, we've done a lot of work just in the last few months through the Public Utilities Office getting an understanding of what our generation mix is likely to look like 
over the next uh, 20 to 30 years, both as a business as usual model, but also under models of different emissions targets, let's say, um, bearing in mind what may or may not happen at a Commonwealth level. Uh, but I think everybody, uh, everyone in the private sector and generally governments are operating under assumptions that uh, there will be emissions targets post-2020 beyond the current RET. So even though we haven't seen in WA the sort of uh, dramatic increases in large scale that you've seen in other states. Uh, there has been reasons for that, but we're resolving those. And to be honest, I'm quite relaxed, being a little bit slower than other states. You know, there have been rollout issues um, and impacts on ancillary services. But the appetite in Western Australia is extraordinary. Effectively, uh, the, the increase in solar PV on... Uh, I'm sure everybody in this room has probably got a solar panel on their roof, costing me a fortune, but... Uh, these are the sorts of things that are seeing um, uh, about 200 megawatts a year coming into the system uh, simply from solar on, on our rooftops, which is wonderful, but is, is posing challenges for the grid and system security and stability. But we're aware of that uh, and we're working through those slowly. I mean, I'm not sure where the Commonwealth's heading now with the legislation around, you know, splitting up... Um, splitting up uh, companies, including publicly owned companies, uh, I suspect it's probably more of a, uh, a narrative than a realistic uh, policy approach from the government. But either way, it's incredibly challenging, it's incredibly uh, exciting, uh, but one that I'm, I think WA is well placed, not being part of the NEM, to, uh, to move down, learning from what's happened in other states. And we've got a question to the left uh, towards the doors. Yep. Um, John Polson from People, Passion and Performance. Um, question for the Premier or for the Treasurer. Um, just interested to hear your vision for tourism and also educational tourism in Western Australia because we have had a, a decline comparatively and it's a fantastic state. How are we going to sell it better? Uh, thanks, John. Um, well, we, we have tourism as one of our central planks for diversification of the economy and uh, we've got a... I've uh, done a few things there. One is uh, the tourism budget is uh, locked into stone uh, for the next few years and we've given tourism absolute certainty on what it's go what's going to be um, what's going to be spent, which was $425 million across the Ford estimates on marketing and events. That allows certainty for tourism at a state level to work with uh, Qantas or private providers. They're very innovative in the way they do things to secure events, to secure joint marketing campaigns and the like. The second string of it is to try and attract more di direct flights uh, into Western Australia. Uh, so Japan, um, which we lost direct flights uh, maybe seven years ago, uh, additional direct flights out of China, which is, means Shanghai, and uh, direct flights out of uh, Mumbai. So those three things uh, we're currently working on. We're hopeful, and you'll see in the West Australian the other day, we're hopeful of some good news out of Japan. The expectation is if we can get direct flights out of Tokyo, that might mean an additional 70,000 or 70,000 Japanese tourists uh, into Western Australia. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, we have all the campaigns and the like uh, we're doing in the East and a whole, you know, events program. Uh, there's been, um, you know, numerous, some pretty good events coming out. We've got Manchester United coming here next year. Um, and I must say, all the British-born people in my electorate seem to be very happy. Um, so um, all of those things we're rolling out at once. Uh, in terms of uh, international education, as you heard the uh, Vice-Chancellor of Curtin, uh, uh, Debbie Terry, Professor Terry, mention earlier, uh, we, have, we are entering into a sort of a strategy with uh, the universities to try and attract uh, more uh, international students into Western Australia. We haven't been doing particularly well in that regard over recent years, and obviously we need to uh, lift our game. Uh, a lot of, uh, when I ask about these things, you know, what is it, why is Sydney and Melbourne do so well? In fact, Sydney's now talking about reducing the number of students because they have too many. Um, it's, uh, what I just get told is, you know, they're mega cities and a lot of students out of China in particular want to go to a mega city. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me because, you know, we're the ones with the great relationship with China, uh, which we intend to keep strong uh, despite um, some of the, uh, some of the uh, commentary around that relationship because uh, it's crucial for the economic success and future of our state and country. Uh, but that, um, that relationship we want to leverage into more students, so I led a delegation up there last year. We'll continue to do important things like that. And I think we've got the final question at the back. Yeah, James Comden, Osiris M. 
Premier, I bumped into John Langelont uh, as I was collecting my name badge and it reminded me of a report that was recently written pertaining to the efficiency with which governments spend its revenue. And it made me think, I wonder what that's going to look like going forward. We, we have a, a good time whereby I think you've indicated there's a $200 million saving in respect of interest and, and also the, the fairer share of GST. What I'd like to know, sir, is in terms going forward under your government, what changes are you going to make to ensure that the efficiency with which we spend our, our funds in this state are going to improve and perhaps not repeat the errors of the past? And may I so boldly and respectfully request that in responding to the question, perhaps not look backwards at what previous governments have done, but perhaps some more proactive, insightful commentary on, on what it is your government intends to do to, to improve that situation. Uh, thank you. And uh, John Langelant's up here at the front. John Langelant's written so many reports, I lose track. Uh, he's uh, done some great work for governments uh, in Western Australia over a long period of time. You're right, John wrote a very, uh, in conjunction with others, wrote a very important and seminal report uh, last year on, um, government, on, on government finances going forward and he recommended a range of things. I think if, if you'd like me to look forward, um, as I said in my speech, uh, we'll get back to uh, surplus in the 1920 financial year and we'll get there by a considerable degree and we expect in the out years um, there will be considerable surpluses after that. What that means is that you can arrest the increase in debt and you can get it uh, heading down. Essentially what it requires is good uh, financial management, proper expenditure review committee processes, spending money on things that are worthwhile and properly testing them with business cases. I can't control what future premiers and future governments do. Uh, what I can do is set the best example we can so that future governments don't uh, make, the, um, make the mistakes uh, of the past. I think what is also important in this regard is not to sort of arrest the debt and then assume that that's an acceptable level and then you track along at that level. What we want to do is start the process of getting it down and that's not easy. Let me tell you in government, it's not easy. There are so many things that people want, um, both the community, um, uh, elements of the workforce, the business community, and everything is always worthwhile and everything is always worthy. And so making difficult decisions is not easy because I didn't, I didn't come to this office after 20 years in parliament um, wanting to be seen as a, um, a Scrooge or a sort of a, you know, a hard man. Uh, I'd r much rather be... Um, a, um, you know, a loved, um, revered figure. Uh, but unfortunately, unfortunately, my lot is not that. Uh, my lot is uh, to have to do difficult things and set an example for future premiers that difficult, you know, you've got to do difficult things in order to get the state back into a uh, fair position. The Treasurer, um, I, might, uh, I might let him uh, say something else uh, on this and hand over to him. Uh, thanks, Premier. And, and look, Ultimately, I get that it's awkward reflecting on the uh, finances and the, what we inherited, but uh, the reality is they do influence every decision I make every day, uh, respectfully. Uh, but there are a couple of things I want to highlight that John Langlon in particular recommended that I do as Treasurer. Uh, two of those um, I just want to reflect on. One, our, we have a range of GTEs, some of them in this room indeed this afternoon. They all do very different things uh, in different parts of government, uh, but... Uh, there has never been a coordinated government response around the governance structures, the expectations that government has of GTEs uh, and the agendas that they set. Yes, I get that often they have independent boards, but, uh, but they're also in a scenario where there's one shareholder, uh, and that's usually the, minister, the relevant line minister. We'll be bringing legislation very shortly. That work's been done, John. You'll be pleased to know. That'll come forward very, very shortly about how we go about grabbing the first lot of GTEs from memory, I think so, the first... 16 uh, and getting that work done. The second point I want to make is in respect of uh, Treasury sitting down the front here. Uh, generally it's not a exciting thing to announce at budget time that you're going to invest uh, in more Treasury people um, uh, and it's something that I haven't announced but we're doing anyway uh, and that was a recommendation understanding that your central agencies are fundamentally important in respect of ensuring that uh, your, age, your government departments also have the capacity to understand their own financial management, their own efficiencies, uh, and that is something we're doing, and, and Treasury are leading that. And one final point I make, and the, uh, and the Premier has spoken about this today, is in respect of the, government, uh, the reduction in government departments. That will 
obviously these things always take longer than you ever expect to, to roll out and get those efficiencies, but they are being delivered. I keep reading occasionally that they're not, but let me assure you, they are being delivered both in terms of budget outcomes, because when you have a larger budget to deal with, you can therefore be more flexible in how you respond to your own internal priorities and policy priorities, but also in the way government makes decisions. That doesn't mean government, you make a decision, you're stagnant, you don't look back at it, and you'll see in the mid-year review we're looking at a few areas where perhaps there might be an opportunity to increase the efficiency of particular agencies in approvals, for example, for the private sector, bearing in mind now we are seeing record high expectations, uh, particularly around mines and regulation. So there might be some opportunities to fix those. But there, make no mistake, whilst it may take longer, it is delivering for government because I see it every single day uh, as I look at the money that comes through the door and money going out. And uh, Premier, you're so right, you don't want to be known as the Scrooge. Leave that title to the Treasurer. <laughs> that draws uh, the question and answer session to an end.